Would you please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11? Mark chapter 11. We're looking at the end of this chapter in verses 27 through 33. And again, here we see what we've been talking about already, the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ chose not to answer a question that was posed to him because of what they were going to do with that answer or with that truth. Um, you know, the, I was thinking about um, you know, um, bringing this out in the sermon, but I didn't want to get us distracted. But the idea of, of speaking the truth or withholding the truth doesn't apply just to uh, the gospel and to spiritual things. Sometimes it also applies to uh, whether or not you would speak the truth to somebody who, who wants, let's say, the truth, but is going to use that truth for something that's evil. And I have in mind there the idea of like, um, you know, Corey Ten Boom situation, hiding Jews in her house. Nazis come to the door, you know, and they, of course, take these Jews, put them in ghettos, eventually exterminated them and so forth. Uh, what, what the Nazis intended to do to the Jews was atrocious. And so you're Corey Ten Boom, you're at the door, you're, you're answering the question. Uh, the Nazis say, you know, do you have any Jews in your house? Well, she obviously did, but what's she going to say? Yes, they are. Come and, come and get them? Or is she going to say no? You know, what did Rahab do when, when she received the spies and then uh, hid them and the soldiers came in? Where are the spies? Did she say, well, I'll show you where I hid them and just give them up? Well, they were going to take them and they were going to slaughter them. What are they going to do with that truth? You see, so there's, there's, this principle is even, is even applied more broadly. You know, that there are times when you withhold the truth, depending upon what that person is going to do. Now, we see that in the case of even Christ himself and things that have to do with him in our text. Let me read that for you. Beginning in verse 27. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But shall we say from men, they were afraid of the multitude, for all considered John to have been a prophet indeed. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. You know, it's almost like Jesus gives a diagnostic question to see whether or not they're worthy to receive that truth, but showing themselves not to be, he withholds it. Now, again, we don't want to forget what we saw last week with regard to Jesus' cleansing of the temple because that was a very important principle. Jesus comes in, he sees the merchandising going on, selling of doves and of sacrificial animals, the, the people at the money at tables, the money changers, where you would take your common currency and change it for the currency of the temple and, of course, for a percentage. Uh, uh, these uh, services were being offered in order that those in the temple might make money. Well, Jesus sees this. He realizes that they're robbing the people of God, and so he, he makes, uh, well, in this case, it didn't say he made the whip. He did on the first occasion. But he drives them all out of the temple, and he overturns the, uh, the tables of the money changers, and he says, stop making my father's house, a robber's den. Get out of here. You're not treating God as holy. Now again, we saw that um, basically our Lord was showing us his zeal for his father's glory. The fact that he took it seriously enough that he was willing to do something about it. He didn't just sit there and say, oh, isn't a shame. This house, which was to be a house of prayer for all the nations, has become a robber's den. We should pray about it. No, he goes in there and he deals with it. Now, of course, he can deal with it in the way he did because he's the Lord of the temple. We would have to go about it in a different way. But the point is, when we see the Lord being dishonored, whether it be in his church, because this was the church of our Lord. These were his people. Even though they were Isra you know, the Israelites, the Jewish church, 
the Old Testament church, it was the only church that existed at that time. There were true believers in it, but there were also a number of unbelievers. So whether it be in the church or whether it be outside the church, we should be willing to stand up for the Lord's honor. And, of course, we also saw that we should be willing to pay the price because if we're not willing to pay the price, we're not going to stand up for his honor. Well, Jesus was certainly willing to pay that price, and uh, we see something of that today as uh, the leaders of the temple come to him and question him. Well, in our text, we see that Jesus comes again to Jerusalem. He didn't spend the night there. He'd keep going out of the city to Bethany. But he comes back. He comes back to the temple. And it's interesting that in this case, we don't see the money changers there. We don't see you know, the people that were there the day before. Uh, looks like his lesson took for now. But uh, the Lord of the temple returns, and again, he's watching, over, he's watching over the temple, making sure that things are going in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. But, of course, what he did the day before angered the, the leaders because they were getting a cut of the money that was being made there, and now their source of income is gone. So Jesus, having taken, as it were, control of the temple, they come to challenge him. They try to discredit him. And they thought up a clever question by which they thought they could uh, catch him that would put him on the horns of a dilemma. And this is really the first of a series of attempts by his enemies to try to discredit him. Now the question they ask is, by what authority do you do these things? What gives you the right to take legitimate businessmen and throw them out of the temple? What gives you the right to teach that this is wrong or to teach the people anything? Who gave you this authority? Well, <coughs> there are only two possibilities. And that is it came from God or it came from men. But before Jesus answered them, he says, I'll ask you a question first. And if you answer me, then I will tell you. The baptism of John, was it from heaven? In other words, did it come from God? Or was it from men? Now, of course, that was a question they weren't ready to, to answer, so they withdrew to reason among themselves. Now, if we say from God, he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you receive his message? Why weren't you baptized? Why aren't you following me instead of questioning me about why I do these things? Well, they couldn't admit to the fact that this came from heaven, that John uh, was sent from heaven. But they, if they said of men... Then they feared the multitude. In a parallel passage, it says, we're afraid the people will stone us if we denounce John and say that he was not from God. So we can't say that. Well, the only way out of this dilemma was to say that we don't know. And Jesus replies, then neither will I tell you. Now, what is going on here? You know, why didn't Jesus just simply tell them the truth? Why didn't you just simply say, I'm the Messiah. I have this authority. I'm sent from heaven. I don't need your authority because I am the Lord of this house. I am the builder of this house. Why didn't he say that? Well, it's because of what these men wanted to do with that truth. They wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to destroy Jesus. And if Jesus were to say, for instance, that my authority to do this comes from God, then they would continue to challenge him as they have in the past. They would try to discredit him as being some kind of an enthusiast, or they might say, you're in league with the devil, as they did earlier. You know, all along, they've been seeking to discredit him. And of course, if he were to say for men, well, they were the ones who had authority over the temple to allow businesses or not allow them, to allow a person to teach, to, as it were, set them apart or ordain them to teaching. And they knew they hadn't given him this authority. And so Jesus would be doing these things illegally. So either way, they would be able to jump on him, as it were, and try to destroy him. But instead of answering the question, he turned the tables and he asked them the same question, which he knew they would not be able to answer. Now, sometimes, I, I think what we gather from this is sometimes the right answer is no answer. There are those who don't deserve to hear the truth because of what they would do with it. Again, going back to that principle where Jesus warns his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount about casting their pearls before swine. If the audience is insincere, if the audience is looking for a reason to reject or perhaps to discredit, 
actually, if they're just downright hostile, they may take the truth that you give to them and try to discredit that, trample it under their feet, and then turn and attack you. This is what they were trying to do to Jesus. And so that's why Jesus refused to answer their question. Now from this, I want us really to look at two different things, and, and uh, hopefully the Lord will use this profitably in our lives. The first thing is that you need to be ready to respond to people uh, regarding your faith regarding the gospel, regarding truth. And um, I, I think we see in scripture that we, we need to be ready to um, formulate or to shape what it is we're saying to adapt it to our audience. And again, we're gonna meet with all different kinds of people as you know, we've already seen several different instances. But then secondly, I want us to see that sometimes the right thing to do with regard to communicating the truth is not to communicate the truth. Sometimes you withhold the truth from others. Now, first of all, you need to adapt to your audience you know, according to their condition. And we know that that applies in many different ways with regard to their understanding, but it certainly applies to their heart condition as well. Now, let's not forget that you and I have a commission from the Lord to share the gospel. I think sometimes we, we read that commission and we think that applies to somebody else, that applies to the church, and that somehow it doesn't apply to me as directly as it actually does, but it does apply directly to us. Jesus in the, in the Great Commission says this again, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, if this had applied only to the disciples at that time, to the 11 that met up with him on one of the mountains in Galilee, then the commission would have ended a long time ago. But it didn't end with them. It's passed on to each successive generation of Christians. This is something that we have a part in. Now, obviously, the, the group of us here are not called to do this whole thing by ourselves. This is something the Lord gives to his whole church. Jesus, when he told his disciples to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, said that they would receive power to be his witnesses. The Lord has also given you his spirit. He has given you power. He has given you that ability to be his witnesses. And he wants you to share that message with others. He wants you to tell them what he has done to save sinners. That's just the simple message of the gospel. By the way, that's what we're hoping to invite people to come and hear on Easter Sunday, is a simple message of what the Lord has done to save sinners. But the second thing you're to share is what he has done particularly to save you. That is your testimony. You know, sometimes um, we think that as we're sharing the gospel that we have to know apologetics, we have to be able to reason from you know, natural revelation to special revelation. We have to be able to answer all the objections that might be raised to the Bible and so forth and the fact that it's the word of God and answer all the questions of evolution and so forth. But you know what? There's two things the Lord has given to each one of us, even if we don't understand all those things, that are really quite powerful. The first one is, of course, the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, which means that it is the message the Spirit of God uses to save even without all the answering of the questions and so forth, you can just simply declare the gospel and tell them this is God's truth and, and urge them to repent and believe. And God will work by his Holy Spirit through that message. But the other thing the Lord has given to you is your testimony, how it has affected you. Just the faith you exhibit, uh, the change of life, uh, the things that you say are a part of your experience having come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. People really, you know, they might, some people might think you're strange. They might think you're crazy. But others, you know, I mean, they'll think about that. I mean, I don't know how many times Mormons tell other people about their burning in the bosom and they take that seriously. Well, that's, that's fictitious. I mean, maybe they do have that sensation, but it's meaningless. It's not sent from God. But you have a real change of life that's been brought about by the Lord and really no one can 
explain that. They, they can try to explain it away, but um, just telling them that this is what has changed, this is what I'm like, and allowing them to see that now and saying that this is what the gospel has done for me is, is really can be quite powerful. So don't be afraid to share those things. Those are the things the Lord has called you to communicate. But again, what you say or how you say it may depend on the situation that you find yourself in. I mean, Jesus met with all different kinds of people and he dealt with them differently. Now, there's going to be one occasion we're going to see just in, in chapter 12 where one of the scribes is going to come to him and say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in, in, the, in the scriptures? And Jesus will tell him and then the scribe will say, well said, this, this is correct. And Jesus will look at him and he'll say, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. Here was a person who came that Jesus knew, as he knows what's in the hearts of all men, that the man had a certain level of sincerity. And so Jesus gave him the truth. He answered his question. And that's obviously what we ought to do. If somebody comes to us and asks us why we believe something or what we believe regarding this or what is our hope, if we see that sincerity, of course we share the truth with them. You know, if they're not sincere, we should also share that truth with them. You know, we often, uh, you, you may have recognized a bit of an allusion to 1 Peter 3, I believe it's verse 15, where we're told that we always need to be able to give a reason for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear or gentleness and reverence. But in the context, it's actually talking about those who would exact that hope from you or that um, reason for that hope in you who are actually, in some sense, attacking you. I mean, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. And do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. I want you to notice the context of that passage. It's not just somebody coming to you sincerely asking, why do you believe in Christ? But it's somebody who seems to be attacking you at some level, which I think shows us that it isn't always the case that if somebody is hostile to some degree that you don't tell them the truth. We're told here that we need to be ready to answer them at all times. And we're going to get to those instances where, they, where we don't give them the truth. Now, what about those people who don't ask, whether sincerely or insincerely? What are you supposed to do with them? Are we supposed to wait for them to ask us before we communicate truth with them? Well, that's where we need to learn to do what Jesus did. Now, again, the idea of Jesus being... Uh, the perfect model, and that is to turn conversations that we get into with other people to spiritual things in a way that is natural. After all, if your life is filled with Christ, if he is what you're all about, if he is the one you're serving, and the things you do, you do because of him all day long, are you going to hide that fact when you talk to somebody else, or are you going to bring that out? We need to learn to live Christ and then to bring those things out. Jesus was speaking to a woman at the well of Samaria. Remember that conversation? And he asked the woman to give him a drink. And, of course, she was a little bit put, uh, put off and maybe a little bit uh, confused why a Jew would ask a Samaritan since we have nothing to do with one another. And then Jesus says, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask of him, and he would give you water that if you drink you'll never thirst again. He takes a conversation that begins with a request for water and turns it around to a spiritual, uh, a spiritual topic, one that has to do with the gospel, one that has to do with the condition of her soul and her need of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need, when people don't ask us, we need to see if perhaps we can change the, the topic of conversation to a spiritual matter, to their spiritual need. Now, if somebody comes to you and wants to argue with you, wants to trick you, wants to try to make Christianity look silly or something, I think we need, in that case, to be ready to answer wisely. 
we're going to see in, in Mark chapter 12 two more questions that are asked Jesus. The Pharisees and the Herodians are going to come to Jesus and ask him regarding taxes. Is it lawful to pay tax to Caesar or not? And it's going to be a trick question, of course, because if he says no, then he'll, they'll seek the Roman government on him. If they say yes, then they'll turn him over to the people and say, look, this guy thinks you ought to pay taxes to this oppressive government. You know, so again, they're going to try to trick him. Or the Sadducees, who give him this instance of a, of a woman who was married to seven brothers and in the resurrection whose you know, wife of the seven is she going to be. But in each case, the Lord is going to answer in a way that will actually declare what is true, but say it in a way that uh, will not allow them to take hold of it and use it against him. Now, in a case like that, we would say Jesus answers wisely. And we need to be able to do that as well, because there are going to be people who are going to try to discredit Christianity, and, and perhaps you'll have the opportunity either to um, you know, overcome that trick, as it were, if other people happen to be listening. They might be listening to you to see whether you can answer that question, and perhaps their decision of which way they're going to go is going to be based on your answer. We do need to study the words. We do need to pray and ask for wisdom to be able to answer questions like that. But again, as we've been given this commission and we have this example of Christ, we need to be ready to do that as well. We really do need to pray that the Lord would help us to adapt to our audience. And as, I, as we talked of before, in, in the context of prayer, we actually do have a promise that the Lord has given to us, a couple of promises where he says that he will do that for us if we are willing to ask and if we are willing actually to communicate and speak. In Matthew 10, verses 19 through 20, as he's, <clears throat> as it were, laying some of the concerns of his disciples as he sends them out to preach the gospel, he says this, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. And then in James 1, verses 5 through 6, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. Now again, this first passage might be understood in the sense of inspiration. You know, perhaps the Lord was saying he was going to communicate directly to them what they needed to say. And that's possible. If that's the case, we don't believe that the Lord is inspiring us today. But that doesn't mean that the Lord will not bring to your mind what you know, that he will not bring scriptures to your mind, that he will not bring arguments to your mind, or even allow you to formulate things in a way that even surprises you as far as how, how, how wise that is and how it was put together and how it answers these questions. I mean, haven't you ever found yourself in a situation where you're trying to answer a difficult question? You've never actually thought through it before, but the answer dawns on you and you're able to speak it. The Spirit of God works in that way to help us adapt the message to those that we're seeking to reach with the gospel. So I do believe that we have a promise and we can pray and ask the Lord to give us the grace to be able to speak what we need to say in the way that we need to say it to those that we would run into. And again, let's not forget that this isn't just academic. We do have a commission. We do need to get that gospel out. And so let's... Um, rely on what the Lord has given to us. First of all, let's make sure we're submitting to that command to try to reach out to others. But secondly, let's remember that we do have to adapt to our audience somewhat because we're going to run into all different kinds of people. Which brings us to the second point, and really the last point, and that is we also need to pray for wisdom when not to speak. Because sometimes the right thing to do is not to speak or to withhold the truth. That's what Jesus did on occasion. Uh, you know that throughout his ministry, there was one thing he was continually trying to hide from the leaders of Israel, and that was the fact that he was the Messiah. Why did he do that? You know, I mean, after all, he was the fulfillment of prophecy. He was everything that they were looking forward to, or at least should have been. 
Well, the reason was because once they realized he was the Messiah, they would try to kill him, and that's why he kept it secret from them. Jesus often spoke in parables for the same reason, to withhold truth or to hide the truth from others. I don't know how many times in different contexts, whether sermons or perhaps classes that I had in college or not in seminary, thankfully, where they would say, Jesus spoke in parables in order to reveal truth. You know, he spoke in parables to make things concrete so you could see them and they'd be more easily understood. But do you realize that Jesus spoke in parables not to reveal the truth, but rather to hide the truth <coughs> from those that ought not to have the truth? If you don't believe me, just listen to what um, he says himself in Matthew 13 when his disciples asked him that very question. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now, take that to a broad evangelical understanding of Jesus and his purpose of coming into the world, and it's just not going to mesh. Jesus came to declare the truth to everyone. Obviously not, because here he was hiding the truth from certain people. Now, again, hiding it from those who didn't deserve to hear the truth. Same thing that happens in our text. Why didn't he just simply tell them, I'm the Messiah? I do this by the authority of God. That's why I cast those thieves out of my temple. Well, he didn't do that because the question was a trap. And it would also reveal that he was the Messiah, in which case they would take him immediately. Now, they're going to take him very shortly anyway. But he was withholding information because of their hostility. Jesus would remain silent when he was placed on trial and he was put before the council. He wouldn't answer any of the charges until the high priest finally adjured him in the name of God. Tell us who you are. And then under those circumstances, he was willing to say that he was the Messiah. And that's all they were looking for. Once they got that information, they immediately condemned him. You know, uh, before they did that, if they handed him over to Pilate, we're not going to see this in Mark, but I believe we do see it in Luke, that when Pilate examines him and he realizes he's from Galilee, the first thing he does is he sends him to Herod. Oh, that's Herod's jurisdiction, so he sends him off to Herod. And when Herod knew that Jesus was coming, he was really excited because he had been hearing about Jesus, and he heard about the miracles that he had done and so forth, and he wanted to see one. And so when Jesus finally shows up, he's all excited, but as he's asking Jesus for information, as he's asking him, telling him to do miracles and so forth, Jesus doesn't do a sign. He doesn't say anything. And why would he do that? After all, Herod seemed like an anxious enough you know, uh, audience. Well, because this is the same Herod that beheaded John. This is the same Herod who thought that Jesus was raised from the dead, or excuse me, that, that he was John raised from the dead, and he sought to kill Jesus because of that. Jesus called this Herod a fox or a wicked person, and so Jesus refused to speak to Herod. Again, truth is not for everyone. Now, again, we, we've already seen several instances where Jesus would speak to a hostile audience, right? It is true, after all, that there are none righteous. None of our audience is going to be a perfect audience. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none who seek after God, and yet we are to give the truth to them. But yet, it's also obvious in Scripture that there's a time when we are not to give the truth, when it becomes a matter of casting pearls before swine. Jesus warned his disciples not to do that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, which you've already seen a couple of times, not to give holy things to dogs and not to cast pearl before swine. In other words, not to give the truth to those who want the truth for some sinister purpose. 
This is what John Gill, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen John Gill's commentary, you really ought to get that. It's a very helpful resource. As a matter of fact, you can get it for free online. If you download eSword uh, for, as a computer program, you can get John Gill's commentary for free and a bunch of other things. But this is what he writes uh, regarding Jesus' statement in Matthew 7 about casting pearl before swine. Here the phrase is used in a metaphorical sense and is generally understood of not delivering or communicating the holy word of God and the truths of the gospel comparable to pearls or the ordinances of it to persons notoriously vile and sinful. To men who being violent and furious persecutors and impudent blasphemers are compared to dogs or to such who are scandalously vile, impure in their lives and conversations, and are therefore compared to swine. So it's not that we are not to communicate the gospel to people who are indisposed toward what we have to say, or who are insincere, or perhaps are going to reject what we have to say, because Jesus shared the gospel with many people who are in that category, but people who are we might say, more extremely opposed to the gospel. Uh, there was one instance where um, uh, we had done some street evangelism years ago, and as people were breaking up, I happened to follow this one person who was trying to share the gospel with him. He turned around and said, one of the most blasphemous things that I'd ever heard really got me upset. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I, I'm not a violent person, but on that occasion, I really felt like punching him in the face. Because it was, it was evil. It was very disrespectful to the Lord. So now the question is, do I continue to talk to that person about Christ? Or do I just simply say, this is a person that you just leave alone? You know, there are people you leave alone, right? Because he had already taken the truth he had received and just spouted blasphemy and injury. He took the truth and trampled it under his feet and then was giving insult and injury to the messenger as well. In a case like that, you don't go on. You don't share the truth with them. So when it appears that the truth really doesn't have any hope of success and that the people you're speaking with are just going to injure you or abuse you, it's time to withhold the truth. So you share the gospel with people who have a hope of receiving it, but you withdraw from those that have no hope, at least as you can see outwardly. Again, don't use that as an excuse not to share the gospel with other people, well, that person won't receive it. That person will just get upset, you know, and oh, that person looks angry. Oh, that, that guy's got a nasty look on his face. I'm not going to talk to him either. You know, we, we do have to interact a little bit and find out kind of where they're at. But uh, again, you need to be careful. There was a, another occasion, I think I may have mentioned it before, where uh, for some reason I felt like the Lord, and again, this was a feeling, wasn't written on the sky and it wasn't, you know, except in the Bible, except by way of the Great Commission. As I was making these deliveries, there was this real burly looking guy. He had kind of a nasty look on his face, and he was, he was big, and you know, I never really talked to him. He just kind of grunt and groan as he walks around, didn't seem very friendly. And yet, I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk to him about the gospel. Talked to the secretary inside, and she said, I, she was a Christian. She said she tried to share with him, and he would just get really angry and so forth. And I thought, well, I really feel like I need to try. So I went and talked with him, and I found out that. He wasn't quite as gnarly and nasty as he looked. So you do have to be careful. He was willing to talk. But after a while, it did become a matter of casting pearl before swine because he didn't want to receive it and wanted instead wanted me to read his, his Aquarian gospel, which is you know, this New Age stuff, which is not from the Lord. So we do need to be careful not to judge prematurely and turn away from people and use as an excuse not to share with people. We need to... You know, sound them out. I think Jesus did a little bit of that in our text when he gave them the question. Are you going to answer this question? If you do, I'll answer your question. But realizing their insincerity because their unwillingness to answer that question, he was unwilling to talk to them. So adapt your message to your audience, but realize that there are instances where you need to withhold the truth. Now, I did want to leave this, though, with, with one challenge, and that is to those of you here, perhaps our youth that haven't made public profession, and also you can tuck this away as, as you would be doing evangelism as well. Just the, the warning that's implied here. 
Because, I mean, who are these scribes? Who are these Pharisees? I mean, where did they come from? Well, they actually were born into families that were in the church, and they were raised in the church. They were. I mean, they were Jews. They were children of Abraham. And yet somehow along the way, they got to the point where they were absolutely hostile toward the gospel, even though they had been raised with the word of God, and who knows what their parents might have been like. Um, they may have been godly, maybe not. But they knew this truth. They, they, you know, when they were born, they weren't so hostile. But little by little, they got this way over the years. I mean, haven't you ever seen somebody, maybe, uh, you know, you, like this, this guy that uh, was spewing blasphemy when I was trying to tell him about the gospel, or you see other people who might curse at you if you tell them about Christ, or people that just seem to be generally angry or whatever it may be. Have you ever wondered how they get that way? I mean, they were born children like the rest of us, and they grew up, I mean, it, it's really how they have responded to a number of things throughout their lives. To correction when they're doing something wrong, or maybe they haven't gotten correction, I don't know. But how do people become hardened toward the truths of the Lord? Well, it's by being exposed to it and by rejecting it. By being exposed to it again and by rejecting it again. Every time you hear the truth, but you don't respond to it in the way that you should. You don't submit to it. Your heart gets a little bit harder until it eventually goes one of two ways. Either the Lord converts you finally or until you reach the point of no return. Now, where do you suppose these people were that Jesus was unwilling to share his truth with? You know, most of these scribes, Pharisees, not all of them, but many of them, were very hostile toward the gospel. There were some of these that actually accused Jesus of casting out demons by Satan, which was absolutely absurd, and Jesus pointed that out. But many of these, having been exposed to the truth of God for all these years and yet rejecting it because Jesus is the fulfillment of all that truth, and when he shows up and they're hostile toward him, it just shows that they're hostile toward the truth of God they had actually reached a point of no return in many cases. When Jesus told those uh, Pharisees that accused him of casting out demons by Satan, they had committed the unpardonable sin. It was too late for them. Now the Lord was going to withhold any more truth from them because of what they would do with it. You don't become that way overnight is the point. You become that way systematically by rejecting the truth that you hear. And I think the point here is this, that you need to guard your heart that you don't fall into this kind of a situation by rejecting the Lord's truth. You need to receive what you hear. And you need to submit to it. Whatever you are to believe, you need to submit to that and believe whatever the Lord promises. You need to believe those promises, whatever he threatens. You need to tremble at those threatenings, whatever he commands. You need to submit to those commands and not resist them, not fight against them. Because little by little, as you do that, it pushes you to the point from which there is no return. There is, there is a line that can be crossed. I think the Bible is quite plain about that. Even Hebrews chapter 6, the author to the Hebrews talks about people who had fallen into that situation. And the situation he's describing is, and he's speaking, I believe, to Jewish believers, is really the context we're talking about here. People raised within the church who had rejected truth systematically throughout their lives until they reached a point where there was nothing more that God was willing to do for them. They had rejected the truth altogether. Don't let that happen to you. Make sure that you receive the truth of God. Don't turn away even from what you're hearing this morning with regard to this message because you know what the message of the gospel is. Same thing that Jesus was preaching. Repent and believe the gospel. Don't put off repentance. Don't put off profession. But instead, submit to the Lord and trust in him and do his will. Well, again, may the Lord grant each of us the grace to do that. And let's not forget again what we've heard regarding evangelism, that the Lord would give us the grace to adapt our message, withhold it when necessary, but realizing there are people out there who are past the point of no return, you need to make sure you never reach that point if you have not believed in the Lord Jesus. 
Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard to our own lives.